Welcome to all our attendees to this panel session on financial organized crime. My name is Eduardo Fiora. I'm a director of strategic intelligence at the risk advisory firm K2 Integrity. And tonight I'll be your moderator. Now, before we start, just some housekeeping. The audience should be on mute. So please um, do stay on mute. Our panelists will start presenting shortly. But we do encourage you to ask uh, questions. And to do that, you're more than welcome to use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. The Q&A will be at the end of the session uh, or perhaps uh, just after each presentation, depending on how many questions we get and when we get, we get these questions. Now, the topic of discussion tonight is financial organized crime. Financial organized crime is the fuel that powers organized crime groups. It's what allows them to grow, prosper, expand, conceal their assets, and so on. And tonight, we'll discuss this topic with a really great panel. We're joined by Dr. Jorge Lasmar, who is a professor of international relations at PUC Minas in Brazil. Jorge holds a PhD in international relations from the LSE in London, and is also the director of legal affairs of the International Association for Security and Intelligence Studies. We will also hear from Giovanni Nicolazzo and Matteo Anastasio. Both Giovanni and Matteo are PhD candidates in criminology at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan, and are also both researchers at Transcrime. We will be joined as well by Mirko Nazzari, who's also a PhD candidate in criminology at the Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore in Milan, and is also a researcher at Transcrime. Lastly, we'll also hear from Dr. Thun van Rutenberg, who's a senior researcher at the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement. His research focuses on organized crime, including mapping the effects, consequences of, and responses to crime policy. We were initially meant to be joined by Dr. Leo Lin, uh, who's a member of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Leo Lin has had uh, personal issues and won't be able to join us in the flesh tonight, but we will show um, a video presentation that Dr. Leo has uh, provided. Anyway, back to our panel. Let's start with Dr. Jorge Lasmar. Uh, Jorge, I understand your research has focused recently on terrorism financing in Brazil. Would you be able to present us your research tonight? Hi, sure. Um, let me try to share the screen. Okay, um, it's saying that I need to quit and re-enter and reopen to be able to open it. To share your presentation. Yeah, just let me try just something, just a second. Of course, please bear with us just a minute. It does say that you have you know, started sharing your screen now. Okay. Okay. Um, where did it go? Just a second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. Right. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for your patience and good morning, good evening, or good night, depending where you are. It's a great, great pleasure for me to be able to join us and to talk about um, such important topic as um, financial crimes. Uh, what I will speak today is a little bit about uh, terrorist financing. I'm going to speak about the case of Brazil. Uh, we have a, a short time, so I'll be brief. What I would like to 
to speak is that usually we do not connect Brazil with terrorism, but uh, we need to understand that terrorism and terrorism attacks are just um, the tip of the iceberg. Usually the groups, they go through what we call the terrorist cycle, which means that before the terrorist attack, they do a lot of activities such as recruiting, training, financing. And after the terrorist attack is the same, they will do evasion, communication, and other issues. So what I want to focus now is to call the attention to the fact that the risk of terrorist financing is very different from the risk of a terrorist attack. And as such, even though the risk of a Brazilian uh, terrorist attack is low, the risk of a terrorist financing is a bit different. In fact, in the um, last year or so, the Brazilian Financial Intelligence Unit actually released a few terrorist financing cases that happened in Brazil. So it's the first official recognition that this terrorist financing flows do happen and they do go through Brazil. So we can think of three ways that these flows happens. They can go from individuals, groups, or entities in Brazil to foreign jurisdictions. They can go from Brazil, uh, Brazilian individuals and groups, entities to finance domestic um, terrorist activities, or they can come from abroad, from individuals and groups and entities abroad to finance domestic um, terrorist activities. So just to illustrate a few cases in Brazil, so starting with how individuals and groups or entities in Brazil try to raise funds, we can see here this case was the first condemnation under the new Brazilian anti-terrorism law, now operation called Hashtag. These are messages that were intercepted in the phones of the participants. And they say that one of their main objectives would be to raise funds for financing the sending of resources and reinforcements to the Islamic State. And they actually said that everything depends of money. So their idea was that to begin with, each one would make a little contribution until they would raise more funds through robberies. And... Afterwards, they had a plan. They wanted to raise $600 so that it could be able to go to Bolivia to buy um, a pistol and some, some ammunition. So they did, did the accounts with the conversion rates and how much each person would need to, to share to be able to do this. And this group were, were planning to do uh, things like attack the Pride Parade in Sao Paulo, or to try to poison the water tanks in Rio de Janeiro. But we also have flows from individuals and groups uh, outside Brazil that send resources to domestic terrorist groups in here. So in this case, we have a terrorist financing using agribusiness and foreign trades, where extremists, we can see the timeline going from left to right. So extremists, outside Brazil, send money to shell companies in Brazil. These shell companies would buy um, farms in the south of Brazil. They would buy uh, outside the legal use black part of the, the money to buy the farms to be black. And they would simulate the exports as a way to transfer funds abroad. And then after that, they would sell the farms by the normal legal price and then justify the difference in the selling and buying price as well to justify the increase of funds. In this other case, we have um, online activities such as uh, crowdfundings, uh, cultural events that raised funds and send money instead to uh, physical persons in Brazil who distributed this money to other members of the group. They took out the money in cash, acquired, acquired a lot of um, extremist material, and then they sent back the remaining money to the group abroad. They also use what we call inverted hawala, in where um, 
refugees would come into Brazil and then they would um, send the money. With the money that they would receive, they would buy um, farms and agro companies and they would use these companies to justify sending money abroad. And finally, we have uh, the flows where individuals in Brazil financing foreign activities. Uh, so in this case, we have uh, border towns where members of both communities of both sides of the border, they have small businesses and religious centers. They are all cash intensive businesses where they would actually use the facility to cross the, the borders to transfer money between the countries. And then they would send the money from Brazil to the Middle East because the neighboring country is um, on a watch list from FATF and that would uh, raise suspicions. And um, this other case is very interesting where the persons involved, they would get fake identities. With these fake identities, they would create uh, accounts, get credit cards. They would use the credit card and pay double the amount that is due. Then they would travel to the Middle East and in the Middle East, they would call the credit card company and say, look, I've paid the bill twice. So the credit card company would give them the credit. They would use this credit in the Middle East to buy um, goods such as computers, televisions, electronics, would sell them there and they would use this as a way to transfer money to the Middle East without actually making a bank transfer. So it was a very creative use. They also use, um, are increasingly using shell companies and legal companies constituted. And usually they make fake imports and exports to transfer this money. And it's being received for shell companies in other countries such as uh, China, Hong Kong, and the United States. So to wrap up and to speak about the, the importance of this, to, to pay attention that the private sector uh, understand that this kind of flows do happen through Brazil. We have um, many cases involving fake IDs, rural property, trade-based money laundering, use of representatives and third parties, shell companies, and especially operations where we have many to one or one to many network. So that's it. I'll be short here. We can get in more details into the Q&A session. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jorge. Uh, sorry, I have just one immediate question from me, actually. Um, you said that quite recently the FIU in Brazil actually highlighted instances of terrorist financing, but what was the situation beforehand? I mean, I struggle to um, appreciate how, you know, late the Brazilian FIU has come to uh, flag instances of terrorist financing. Why wasn't the FIU flagging such instances beforehand? It's not that um, FIU was not flagging, but the uh, FIU um, previous orientation was just to do the list checking. So um, th this story is actually very long and complex and has to do with the, the evolution of the legislation in Brazil. The anti-terrorism legislation came only in 2016. And actually, this was one of the big uh, pressure points from the FATF over Brazil, because we didn't have a law specifically for the financing of terrorism, especially for the freezing of assets. So this legislation came just a, a few years later when Brazil was being threatened to be put on the gray list by the FATF. So this is a very recent development. And then what happened is that Brazil was evaluated by the FATF this year. So the Evaluation should come out later this month or beginning of next month. And for that, Brazil did its first um, national risk assessment. And within this risk assessment, it's the first time they did the risk assessment for the terrorist financing. And all these cases that I presented, with the exception of the first, 
They are all actually um, being published by the Brazilian um, FIU um, to instruct the private sector and show what kind of um, terrorist financing was happening in, in Brazil. The, the issue was very political as well. There is a lot of to do with the, the previous administration, the current administration that is this FED. So just to give an idea, we still do not have any designated terrorist groups in Brazil. Thank you. That's quite striking, actually, to think that there's no designated terrorist groups in Brazil. And yeah, Brazil, uh, sorry, because um, no, no, Brazil... Yeah, no, it's just because Brazil considers the only the, the ones that have been designated by the UN, which is the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Islamic State. But it doesn't have a, a freeze list. So there is no designation. So this has been under a lot of flack because of the whole Hamas situation, evidently, yeah. as well. And just very briefly, um, could you please expand on the inverted awala for us? Because I found that quite fascinating. I mean, money laundering practitioners study awala, but I found the inverted awala quite interesting. No, it's just about the direction of the, the sending of the funds, because usually when we talk about hawala, we're talking about a way to take the money out of the country. And in this sense, it's being called inverted hawala because they brought the money inside the country. But one very interesting development that we've been seeing in Brazil, and I believe this must be happening in other places regarding the illegal hawala, is the um, raising the e-hawala trend. So that's been changing the scenery because usually the hawala is very much in Brazil, at least is very much linked to hawala dars in the Middle East, but the e-hawala groups are usually linked to, to China or other country that have more, um, more resources to do um, crypto active transactions. So this has been quite a shuffle in the black markets lately, actually. Well, that's great. Thank you very much for the clarifications. And again, to the audience, if anyone has any questions for Jorge, please um, feel free to type your questions in the Q&A uh, section below. Um, now, in the interest of time, um, let's move to a completely different regional area. So thank you once again, Jorge. Um, I would like to essentially yield the floor to Giovanni Nicolazzo and Matteo Anastasio. They have done some incredible research into the ownership of uh, businesses in, e in the EU, across the EU, by sanctioned Russian entities. So, um, Giovanni, Matteo, please tell us more. Hey, everyone. Can you see us in the presentation? Yeah, it's perfect. Perfect. Thank you very much. So this presentation, yes, as you were as you are saying, is focused on framing and detecting uh, sanction, targeted sanction, evasion, violation, circumvention techniques by Russian individual and entities. It is part of a broader European project founded, founded by the European Union that is on strengthening EU asset recovery and uh, sanction policy uh, against transnational high level corruption. It is a very wide project with many, many partners. I'm not, for time issues, I will not delve into the description of all the phases of the project, but we will post in the chat the links to our social media and to our website in order you to get all the updates about it. So to begin with, a brief introduction related to sanctions. Uh, of course, after the annexation of Crimea in the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, Europe, Western powers have imposed a wide range of economic sanctions. Very, very widely, economic sanctions may be comprehensive or targeted. There are many distinctions uh, within sanctions, but overall, comprehensive sanctions target all at the economy of a country, typically an embargo, and targeted, tar and targeted sanctions hit just specific individuals and economic sectors. This is just a graph showing the exponential growth of targeted individuals by the European Union. You can see after the invasion of Ukraine, what is the scale? Uh, very briefly, literature review, uh, the research on sanctions against Russia has three main focus, I would say three main levels. The first one is the country level, so basically estimates of GDP. We have more uh, clear estimates for the first wave of sanction, less clear estimates for the second one, but for the second one, we are around the three or five percent of GDP. 
The second level is a market or sector level. For example, for our interest, uh, there is some papers that identify the proximity penalty related to Ukraine that justifies also other geographical scope that is Europe, because it's the, the area that is most affected by the economic effects of sanctions. And the third level is a firm level, um, where there is, I would say, some debate uh, because, you know, research, research, recent research has shown how the sanctions change the strategies of, of firms and also how targeted sanctions change firm performance. But the research is divided since we have some evidence that they have some very, very huge negative effects and losses on companies, uh, as you can see from, from, from those two pieces of research. On the other hand, we have some ends related to the shielding effect and the shielding action of the Russian state related to uh, its assets. We know that this is true mainly for internal companies, companies that are internal to the Russian economy. We don't know, we don't have many elements on European companies that are owned by targeted individuals. So how also the Russian state and if the Russian state tries also to shield those, uh, those economic assets that favor the Russian oligarchy. So um, a very brief uh, re resume, I would say, of the main um, obligations that arise from the freezing of funds. Uh, mainly we have two obligations. There are uh, the freezing of funds and economic resources. So what does it mean? It means that um, funds, funds and economic resources are really different. Funds are financial assets, mainly. Economic resources are assets that may create goods, services, and funds, okay? So they respond, they, they're, they're freezing answer to different uh, logical and to different ratios. But in general, all funds should be frozen, meaning they can't be used, and economic resources should be frozen, means they shouldn't be uh, capable of producing economic value. And the second one is the prohibition to make funds or economic resources available to sanctioned entities, of course. So uh, here we have a policy problem that we try to, to, to address, that is the violation of EU restrictive measure. That is a criminal penalty under recent European legislation, recent European directive. Nevertheless, the directive itself does not uh, define what is violation, what is uh, convention, but it only provides for some cases, you know, some examples of what may be considered a violation, of what may be considered a convention, and it does not distinguish a convention from violation, but it considers a convention as a subspecies of violation. And this doesn't clarify the policy problem and the, and the theoretical problem that is related to the definition of violation, evasion, circumventions, what, does the, what do those terms mean? Um, this is aggravated by the, the fact that no relevant case law exists. We have just one few main uh, case law that just states there are different things, but they, that, that don't, uh, does not explain uh, what, in what consists this difference. And also another main problem that we also try to address in our study is difficult to personalization of, uh, of, of the control and of the, of the links to of the assets to the designated persons. Another problem is, uh, another policy problem, is an absence of a central enforcement authority that unifies the enforcement of sanctions. We, in this study, uh, use, let's say, this operational definition of sanction violation and circumvention so all those behaviors, violation is all those behaviors that are contrary to specific regula regulatory provisions. So meaning making funds available or, uh, you know, failing to freeze an asset, while sanctions or convention are those conducts that avoid the effect of sanctions. So try to create an appearance of legitimacy, legitimacy under the, the, the ownership and the control of the assets by Russian entities. So very, very few policies. We have some studies related to the usual strategies that Russians use to, to consider assets. And they usually use family members, real estates, ownership structures. We're going to show all of these results of our research uh, confirm this policy ends. So this is our third three uh, research questions that focus on uh, what are the countries that are most highly exposed to Russian presence 
the primary economic sectors and how we can you know, go into this debate and these policy issues of uh, evasion and circumvention violation. I leave the floor to Giovanni for the rest. So in order to address those questions, we need to identify the relevant data sources that allow us to identify the connection between sanctioned entities to European company in this case. And therefore, the data source that we are going to use are the consolidated sanction list by EU and the OFAC, and then the data sets of company information that contain information about owners, shareholders of all company in Europe, but mainly also worldwide. And then we adopt a tracing approach to reconstruct the network of control between those European company and the sanctioned entities. So I will be very short on description of the methodology of the tracing approach, but basically we start from the EU and Alpha consolidated sanction list. And we of course standardize those because these are very different data sources and therefore you can imagine that they have have different structure of the data. We filtered for all the sanctioned entities under the Ukraine program, therefore in relation to the large scale invasion of Ukraine. And then we match these uh, consolidated sanction list with the data set containing company information, therefore information about shareholders and administrators of all worldwide company. And we propose some matches. Then we do validate the matches thanks to the personal information that the consolidated sanction list provide of the sanctioned entities. And then we reconstruct the control that these confirmed match have within the European companies. And so the preliminary results allowed us to identify 800 sanctioned entities that have a formal connection in more than 16,000 of European company. Specifically, we have more than 400 of individuals sanctioned by the EU, having as of December 2021 connection with European company, and about 400 individuals sanctioned by the OFAC and not the EU, having you know direct or indirect shareholders or directors ship links with European company as of December 2021, therefore a few months before the invasion of Ukraine and therefore the designation of those entities. For what concerns the countries that are mostly exposed to those sanctioned entities, we have of course the countries in the east of Europe. Ukraine has a large exposure to uh, companies that are linked to sanctioned entities, but we also have a high exposure in countries such as United Kingdom, Bulgaria and Germany. Well, for what concerned the sectors, apart from the wholesale trade that also contained the largest amount also of a company, I mean, active in Europe, we can see that a lot of company under the control of sanctioned entities are inside the financial service activities and the real estate activities. And these findings somehow confirm also the anecdotic evidence coming from, you know, the laundromat the scandal yeah, that before identified has yeah, the London economy, and thanks to the real estate sector, was holding a lot of the assets under the control of the so-called Russian oligarchs. But the main objective of the study was also to attempt the changes in ownership in those companies after December 2021, therefore after the designation of those entities in the sanction list, in order to conceal the link that they had on those European companies. In order to do that, we extrapolated uh, manually some cases of companies in which the ownership structure from December 2021 to September 2022 changed. And we highlight the characteristics of those changes in the ownership structure, the timing of the changes. Uh, and so now we are going to provide the basic preliminary results of these 20 case study that we identified. These were the ownership structure in which the control of sanctioned entities was relevant in uh, December 2021. And therefore, in these slides, you can see that the red elements identify cases in which the changes in ownership structure intervene uh, later the uh, entrance of these entities in the sanction list, while the blue elements identify cases in which the ownership structure changes a few months before the uh, designation of these entities in the sanction list. In some cases, we have sanctioned entities that were designated 
created in August 2022, but the ownership structure changed, for instance, in July 2022. I do remind that this connection refers to individuals that were linked to this company as of December 2021, and this is one of the most valuable things of this analysis. It allows us to picture the connection that they have before the starting of the war in Ukraine. Uh, so which were the patterns that we identified in relation to the change in ownership? One pattern we call a simple replacement, meaning that the shirt that was held by the designated person is simply transferred to another entity. And then in some other cases, we see not only the disappearance of the, the sanctioned entities in the ownership structure, but also changes in the company structure, for instance, increase of complexity or increasing the fragmentation of the structure. And then another partner is the dilution of ownership shared, meaning the company is still connected to the sanctioned entities, by, but by an amount that is lower than it was in December 2021. And here I'm going to show you some cases of a simple replacement partner that for changing the ownership structure. This was the situation of this company in December 2021, when this designated person totally owned the controlled company in Europe. But as of September 2022, uh, this, control, this company is controlled by another entity that for there is a total change of the share, the designated person gives the entire share to these entities, but these entities does not allow to understand who there is actually behind yeah, its yeah, share link. And this is another case of simple replacement. In December 2021, we have the designated person that was the majority owners of the controlled company, but as of September 2022, the role of majority owned is yeah, you know, covered by a new shareholder. These are the simple replacement scheme, but we also see some cases of structural changes, meaning in December 2021, the company structure was quite complex and fragmented, but the designated person was a controlling shareholder of those company. As of September 2022, we see the disappearance of this designated person and a very change in the ownership structure that is just controlled by a new shareholder. But another case is related to the dilution of ownership share, meaning as of December 2021, the designated person was the total owner of this company but in December in September 2022 we still see the designated person linked to this company but as a minority shareholder and generally for what concerns specifically also the um, United States rules in this case this controlled company if the designated person is a minority shareholder therefore below the 50 percent of control should not be considered under the control therefore of these designated entities so this may be a scheme you know in order to avoid the effect of the designation and this is another example of the relation of shared. So the main results suggest that in the case that we have analyzed, we have witnesses case of sample substitution, but also cases of disappearance and change in ownership structure. In small cases, we do see um, that in presence of the designated person in the ownership structure, but just the dilution of ownership share. Just for conclude, that further we can say that the majority of beneficial ownership concealment were executed to simple partners. In certain instances, some opaque entities and high risk jurisdiction were utilized to conceal the links between the company and the sanctioned entities. But of course, for the research is needed to understand the rate of ownership uh, shift and to expand therefore, the result of this analysis. Thank you for your time. Guys, thank you very much. Extremely interesting. We've actually got some questions for you, which however, we'll submit towards the end because we have to be <laughs> Uh, quite quick uh, with time. So um, just in the interest of time, I'll move on quickly on to Mirko Nazari, um, who will actually talk about uh, an overarching theme that we've discussed tonight, so money laundering, but with an interesting twist. So he'll discuss the money laundering strategies of cyber criminals. Uh, Mirko, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Eduardo. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Uh, so actually today I'm going to present um, my paper called From Payday to Payoff, Exploring the Money Laundering Strategies of Cyber Criminals that's been recently published in Trends in Organized Crime. So I'll just give you a couple of information, uh, of course, to be brief due to some time constraints. Uh, as a background, we all know that new technologies have been assumed to be facilitation tools for money laundering since basically late 90s. Um, because of course they provide new opportunities to be exploited, new tools that offenders can use to launder their illicit proceeds. But over the decades, such concern basically has led to the rise of the so-called cyber laundering concept, 
actually in both the academic and policy debates. Um, cyber laundering is actually uh, raised to become a different concept, uh, slightly different compared to my laundering. It's assumed to be more complex, more difficult to identify, more difficult to prosecute and investigate, basically. And the main mainstream narrative argues that basically cyber criminals make extensive use of obfuscation techniques to anonymize their financial activities. And this is basically a direct citation from the latest uh, Europol IOTA, so the inter Internet Organized Crime Threat Assessment has been published actually recently. Uh, but these um, actually claims are based on weak premises, if we, if we want to say so, because uh, actually to the best of my knowledge, I mean, generally looking at the criminological literature, only a few studies empirically analyze the money laundering strategy of cyber criminals. And most of the scholars in this domain also highlighted uh, the limited no technical knowledge and the skills of these offenders in some cases, of course. So as a result, there is still the need for exploration of the ways the members of cyber criminals networks spend their criminal earnings. So moving to, to data and methodology, so to address the main research question is actually a broad one. So how do cyber criminals launder the illicit proceeds? I decided to focus on a specific case studies. Uh, that's the Conti ransomware group. Uh, I don't know um, if you are familiar with this, uh, with this group, but basically was one of the most dominant ransomware groups in 2021. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, actually, of 2022, uh, right after the invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, has been mentioned by my colleagues earlier, uh, Conti actually supported the invasion. Uh, and in return, they got hacked by a Ukrainian researcher, allegedly, uh, who dumped online all their internal communications. So they were made public more than 150,000 messages that uh, these offenders exchanged between themselves to discuss different topics, basically. Um, and from this dump that, again, is now public and you can find it online, uh, I went through the messages that I retrieved, all the Bitcoin addresses that were uh, mentioned. And out of these more than 600 actually Bitcoin addresses, I focus on uh, 182 Bitcoin addresses that were used by 56 members of Conti to collect wage payments. Basically, each member went to the boss, asked uh, for payment of the wage. They usually got paid twice per month. Uh, and of course, they received the, pay, the wage uh, actually in Bitcoin. Uh, as you know, Bitcoin is a pseudonymous cryptocurrency, so it's possible uh, to follow the money flows through it. And for that purpose, I specifically relied on Scorchain tool. On the Scorchain tool, that's basically uh, Scorchain is a cryptocurrency um, uh, company that provides basically blockchain analytics tool. Uh, and using this tool, I managed to retrieve a wide range actually of information. Uh, including the type of address, the balance of the addresses, the timestamp of the transactions, the amounts, and of course, also the destination of the fund, as I was interested in looking at the money laundering. So um, the, specifically, and we will see in the last part of the presentation, the results from the blockchain analysis has also been coupled with a couple of uh, in the selection of chat logs and messages from the data to add some qualitative depth uh, to this analysis. So going right into the the results, uh, the, the median actually wage payment was quite low, and these are actually an interesting result. I'm now looking into, together with another colleague, uh, was basically $834 per month. So you see that's actually the earn little amount of money. 91% uh, of the addresses uh, basically belong to non custodial wallets. Uh, so they were not hosted by uh, virtual asset service providers. Uh, they actually are based entities, third-party entities that allow you, uh, as a, of course, a cryptocurrency holder, to um, carry out a couple of um, activities. 82% um, of the addresses only had two transactions, so they just received the wage and they moved the money to start the laundering process. Uh, and interestingly, almost all of them, the 90 basically uh, start laundering the list of in one single transaction. So they took or they received all the money and they took all the money out in one single transaction without starting layering uh, the funds in. Uh, it's interesting also that they start moving basically the money right away, I would say. So after three days, basically, of receiving the illicit wage on their Bitcoin address, they started also uh, moving the funds and starting the listing to the money laundering process. Uh, this is actually a basic bar graph showing the main destinations of the funds, 
as you can see, 71% of the Bitcoin addresses transacted in an exchange, uh, followed by dark web services, you know, 30%, payment service, 14%, gambling website, 13%, and just 80% uh, with mixing services. Um, this is actually interesting uh, because, again, we see a, a picture that's quite different from the main uh, narrative. We see that most of them actually engage with simple transactions with exchanges, uh, or either dark web services, while more complex themes in a way involving, for example, the mixing of the illicit proceeds through uh, mixers is quite um, less relevant at the moment. It's also interesting to know that 80% uh, of the illicit proceeds were sent to one singular services in 69% of the transactions. So illicit proceeds were actually aggregated uh, towards the uh, one singular services without again layering the, fine, the, the, the funds and so actually increasing the potential risk uh, of detection in this case. Uh, just moving to the to the last part of the of the presentation, I also wanted to show you these two basic actually this, um, communication and messages exchanged between the members. As you can see, the first one actually this, uh, um, refers to the hiring process of one new member within the group when the basically HR uh, manager uh, told him that wages, uh, of course, are paid in Bitcoin. Uh, well, I recommend using a mixer to, um, to, the, to which actually the new member replied, well, there is an understanding with cryptocurrencies, but what is a mixer? So you can see basically that there is no common knowledge actually on the tools and the methods that they can use to launder the illicit proceeds. So again, going against the main narrative that all these offenders, because they are cyber criminal, they can also be they are actually complex, they are mm, technologically advanced, and they say tech savvy in a way. Uh, and the second one is basically uh, the same, and this actually shows uh, less experience in the money laundering process because it said, it's a, also in this case, it was a member um, um, actually sending a message to, to the boss of the organization telling, hello, the exchange refused accepting the funds. They say that they come from unsafe sources. What should I do in such cases? I sent to the mixer, I'm waiting, maybe it will help. This is interesting for two main reasons. First of all, you see that what they do is just receive the wage and then send the money strictly and directly to an exchange to cash them out, basically. So there was not basically any type or any attempt, attempt to disguise the illicit origin of these proceeds. So there was basically no money laundering. And once the funds were detected, basically exchanged uh, to, to come from unsafe sources, then they tried to use a mixer so using actually a reverse process that is not really effective uh, nor uh, efficient for, for what it matters. Um, so just a couple of points to, to discuss that I wanted to, to provide to you is basically that offenders in my sample, at least I'm referring only to 56 members, uh, use good operational security practices. So they strictly rely, for example, non-custodial wallets. So they do not use wallets that are hosted by third parties. Uh, that they basically can actually uh, need to comply to anti-money laundering obligations and can freeze the funds in case of an investigation. Uh, for example, they just relied you know, uh, on just two transactions, so receiving the funds and moving them out without using the same address for more transactions. But at the same time, they tend to be unsurprising, surprising, sorry, unsophisticated when it comes to money laundering. Um, there can be different options and different explanations. I would say that the lack of sophistication, in a way, can be related to the small amounts. First of all, we know that the median wage payment was little more than eight hundred dollars. Uh, so, in a way, you know, if I I have small amounts, so this proceed, I do not need maybe to engage in more complex money laundering schemes. At the same time, and it's potentially a, an interesting driver to explore more is that they lack specifically specific expertise on money laundering tools, for example, they can use on the procedures that they need to uh, carry out uh, to disguise the illicit origin of the proceeds. Um, in a way, is also, lastly, the, the wider regulatory environment, because we know that, of course, uh, cryptocurrencies um, and digital assets service providers, in this case, are now obliged entities under anti-money laundering legislations. But we also know from the latest report from FATF that most uh, jurisdictions uh, worldwide basically do not comply still with FATAP recommendations, for example, and uh, they do not enforce the standards in this case. So this is, of course, a matter of uh, of interest in the, for, for further analysis. But my last key takeaway in this case was that even allegedly successful offenders use basic uh, money laundering strategies, as it is quite actually interesting. 
Mirko, uh, thank you very much. Sorry, I, I need to cut you off. It's incredibly interesting and I encourage okay. people to ask questions. Yes. Uh, let's quickly move on to Dr. Thun by Rutenberg. Um, what is financial crime scripting? It's the first time I hear about financial crime scripting and I'd be very fascinated to hear more about it. So over to you, um, Thun. All righty, good evening. I have to wait before you will close your share screen. Yep, there you go. Perfect, we can see it. You can see the full screen now, I hope. You can hear me as well. So um, we'll be happy to start. Uh, my name is Teun van Ruitenburg. I will be presenting also on behalf of Tom Slapan. Uh, we both work for the Center of Expertise, Safe and Resilient Society. And I also work at the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And today, uh, in this upcoming 10 minutes, I will speak about indeed what is financial crime scripting. Um, it is, we will be presenting the method financial crime scripting on which we recently, a few months ago, published a Dutch uh, a book on. And we just finished this week our uh, um, scientific journal on this method. So. Uh, and to, so today is the perfect day to also, well, explain to you in person what this method entails. Um, also presenting uh, um, on behalf of Manon Kostense, who also worked uh, on this method. Um, uh, so what I want to do, do today is basically start off with a short introduction on crime scripting as a method, and then focus on the financial aspects of criminal activities very shortly to move on very quickly to what is financial crime scripting and what is the added value of this method. Um, so to just simply start off with the basics, what is crime script analysis? And I hope and, well, assume most of you will have heard from this crime script analysis, so I won't dive into it too much today. But basically what it does, it's, an, it's a method int introduced in the criminology in the mid-90s, and the aim of this method, which is based on rational choice uh, theory, uh, um, among other things, it is to generate, organize, and systematize knowledge about the procedural aspects and procedural requirements of uh, a crime uh, uh, of crime commission. And what it basically does is to that as a researcher, you're able to build a script, sort of a film script, on uh, uh, about a specific type of crime in order to see how does crime, crime work? And if you know how the, uh, how a criminal uh, conducts, commits a crime, it's also easier to intervene to frustrate a crime, um, so to say. So there are various ways to do crime script analysis. It's very useful, uh, which is shown also in this uh, slide. Recently, there's a literature review being done on the method of crime scripting and how it's used within criminology and beyond criminology. And here, as you can tell, from the last, well, the last decade or so, more and more research has started to use crime scripting to actually gain knowledge on how, again, crime works exactly. You could do, again, a lot of types of, of crime scripting on the level of the meta script, on the proto script, on the script level, on the track level. I won't go into that uh, today, but just to give you an idea on how it's being used um, uh, lately in recent recent decade. And in the same literature review, you can also see, um, this is a literature review of our colleagues uh, elsewhere, that crime scripting is used uh, for cybercrime, and at, at least in the last two decades, uh, most of the time for cybercrime, corruption, robbery, drug offenses, environmental crime, crime even, violent crimes and sexual offense and uh, other types of crime. However, what we think and our thesis of today together with Tom is that we forgot doing crime script analysis about a very important component, that is money, simply said. This is an example of a document on the series of organized crime threat assessment, which shows that, well, criminal activities, most criminal activities until three major consecutive process steps linked to production of illegal goods, transport of persons or physical goods, and the explo exploitation of persons. But what it also said uh, is that 
all these um, the so supporting processes of, of, of these three processes is the handling of money flows in all types of crime, all types of uh, organized crime. In particular, money is, is plays a key role, and we forgot to include the financial component within crime scripting as a methodology. So, as I said, um, uh, most uh, uh, crimes is profit driven, especially organized crime, and money is simply what attracts potential of future criminals. Money is also what empowers criminals. And obviously the proceeds of crime, illegal money can be intertwined with society and the legal financial system, which has an undermining effect on society. So that is basically what we think financial crime scripting is. What it's not is that we think we should build crime scripts or financial crimes. No, we think that uh, uh, the financial component should be inherently linked to all crime scripts. So financial crime script is mapping the mapping of financial economic aspects of various crime types based on the method of crime script analysis. So basically what, it, what we try to do with this method is if you have a crime script, this is a very simplified view of the crime script of the import of cocaine in the Netherlands, we should in every step, in every scene of this crime script, we should link and include a price tax put it simple. What is the role of money within each scene of a crime script? And how do we do it? I won't go into detail. We wrote a book about it. I don't have the time to, to go into de detail about the, the whole methodology. But what we basically do, as we uh, show in, 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 in this uh, slide, is this is the, in, well, the first few steps of uh, the import of cocaine crime script. Um, and you see uh, in dark blue, you see the different scenes of the script. In light blue, you see the various modus operandi. In or orange, the different roles. And yellow, the different activities taking place by these different roles. And each activity also can be distinguished in a primary activi activi uh, activity and a secondary. And basically, to develop a financial crime script, then, we should raise, that is how, what we propose to do, you should raise various financial questions uh, and obviously also try to answer these financial crime script links to every role and every activity within a crime script. Um, and these, these questions are, are actually seven questions. What is the activity? Why do criminals do it? What are the revenues and the cost of, of these activities? Uh, who does it? Who sends the money? Who gets it? How do they send money uh, within a crime script? And where is the money? Place and what is the time and settlement of each payment? So difficult questions to answer, maybe, but you try. You have to try to answer these to fill uh, to fill this financial crime script. Actually, to develop this crime script. Um, so you can focus on the different roles within the crime script. There are sometimes specific roles, such as the financer, um, but you should also focus on the who. So look into the money flows between the sender and the receiver of that role. And you can add the price tag uh, to the revenues uh, minus the cost from each activity. Basically, what is more, even more important besides focusing on the different roles is to look into the different activities within a crime script, as I've, I have shown uh, a few slides ago. So you have to focus on the primary activities, on the revenues, for instance. What are the revenues of each activity? Uh, among other things, this is dependent on the availability of the legal goods, the original investment, demand, quantity, et cetera, et cetera. But also look into the cost of each, uh, um, uh, of, of each activity, which is also, again, based on price, place, skill, et cetera. And what we also tend to forget with it when we build crime scripts in general is to look into how are people paid, not only at the end of a crime script, but every role within a crime script uh, gets paid. Um, and it's very interesting to look into the settlement of these payments. How are people actually uh, uh, paid? Uh, when and how? Uh, uh, and also, by is it by cash, by bank accounts, by cryptocurrency, etc.? And all these, and this is just a, a small fraction of all the things you have, you can include within this financial crime script. But if you raise these financial so, crime scripts, you can actually build a financial crime script. Sorry, Tim. Yeah. That was incredibly interesting. Such a shame that your slides were not working properly. So perhaps we'll share them with the rest of the uh, oh, that is a shame. These later. Um, let's just quickly move on to the uh, video presentation by 
um, Leo Lin, who unfortunately cannot uh, be with us tonight. And if you can please stop sharing your screen. All righty. Um, I was almost finished, by the way, but uh, that's <laughs> almost there. Um, stop sharing. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Dr. Leo Lin. I am the director of the Institute for Asian Crime and Security. And my topic today is cybercrime and the use of cryptocurrencies in money laundering. And I'll be using Taiwan as case study. And because I have only 10 minutes, so I will do it uh, short and sweet. Thank you. Uh, this is my outline. Uh, as you can see, I have broken it down into uh, several sections. Introduction, research questions, literature review, blockchain, rational choice theory. That's, that will be my main point and the application of the theory uh, to look at uh, the case of Taiwan and draw implications and a conclusion. This is the image that I found online, and that's pretty interesting. It goes, no one has ever heard about the perfect crime because it is too perfect. So introduction. In the area of technology, uh, cryptocurrencies have become a very important, uh, important concept that attract criminals because they provide anonymity, uh, anonymity uh, borderless, and they are user friendly. As a technology advances, uh, so do criminal tactics. So three emerging uh, threats within blockchain technologies uh, are uh, presented here. First, the shift from 1G to 5G networks uh, bring lightning fast data transmission, allowing criminals to conduct large scale data theft and exploit crypto exchange vulnerabilities efficiently. And second, DeFi, short for decentralized finance, offers services without uh, intermediaries, but exposes new risks uh, like money laundering and fraud. The third, cryptocurrencies border this nature facilitates cross-border crimes and uh, that, for example, terrorist financing and also uh, making detection and tracking challenging. There are two research questions. First, how can rational choice theory be applied to understand cryptocurrency related crimes? And second, what insights can the case of Taiwan provide and what countermeasures uh, can be suggested? Uh, I did uh, some literature review and in those studies, uh, cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, they are closely tied to money laundering. And these studies highlight the concern about cryptocurrencies are using money laundering and crypto markets, calling for uh, collaboration from governments, uh, law enforcement, and regulatory bodies. And the purpose is to ensure financial ecosystem security. This paper uses literature induction and rational choice theory to understand and examine uh, cryptocurrency related crime dynamics and involves analyzing existing research, identifying research gaps and collecting data from various sources uh, in Taiwan, including uh, public uh, government publications, uh, archives, and also uh, some field research, uh, field work. Uh, research. The rational choice theory explains that criminals make rational decisions before committing a crime. Uh, they weigh factors like time, cognitive ability, and available information. And there are four key elements uh, with 
within the blockchain rational choice environment. Uh, the first one is information, interests, uh, beliefs about opportunities, and action. These four elements are interconnected. Information can influence beliefs, and beliefs can affect actions, creating a dynamic and involving decision-making process within a blockchain environment. So in Taiwan, a cyber criminals find themselves in a unique decision-making landscape. Uh, regarding information, they see the blockchain as a powerful tool with a double-edged nature. On one hand, its transparency and data immutability pose risks as this features can expose their activities. On the other hand, uh, a decentralized nature allows them to effectively conceal their identities and evade detection. For interests, cyber criminals in Taiwan are targeting the blockchain space, often aim to steal valuable uh, virtual assets and cryptocurrencies. And their driving force is the potential financial gains and they could uh, secure through this theft. And beliefs about opportunities. In Taiwan, cyber criminals believe that blockchain environment offers unique opportunities for anonymity, and uh, they see this as a way to reduce risk of being identified. And for action, uh, the information-rich environment of the blockchain motivates these criminals to develop sophisticated attack as strategies and events malware, um, and they can use them to conduct uh, their cyber enabled and cyber dependent crimes. There are several main types of cyber uh, currency related crimes in Taiwan. Uh, the first one is fraud, and it has been very serious concern for the authorities here in Taiwan, and um, and. Uh, for now, it's, it's become a uh, headache uh, for uh, law enforcement as well. And also money laundering, a third party money laundering is uh, prevalent with shell companies and intermediaries obscuring the origin of funds. And also online gambling, uh, underground wire transfer scams, um, which is pretty common uh, between the cross strait uh, between Taiwan and China, and also ransomware targeting individuals and uh, businesses. Uh, so those are uh, major types. And in this chart, as we can see, the number of uh, cases of virtual currency crime and the money loss is, uh, is uh, like increasing and the cases are rampant. And uh, we're expected that at the end of this year, uh, they, uh, we're going to have a record high a number of cases and a number of money laws uh, re relating to virtual currency crimes. For implications, a rational choice theory tells us uh, that decision makers' actions are shaped by their interests and beliefs. In the context of cryptocurrency crimes, organizations and governments must understand blockchain technologies' risks. Um, but because of lack of knowledge among those government officials and uh, citizens, it has become a challenge for uh, not only law enforcement, but regulatory bodies to really uh, stop the uh, spread of the crypto cryptocurrency related crimes. And also COVID-19 pandemic uh, has been a key factor that uh, drives cyber criminals to move towards uh, this direction of using cyber currency related crimes uh, like, and tactics uh, to uh, gain illicit funds. To combat these challenges and crimes, uh, a comprehensive approach is needed and they are, it is essential. Uh, we have to fortify transaction security uh, improving uh, and implement robust measures like multi-factor uh, authentication uh, and smart contract technology. 
and also we can uh, we have to strengthen know your customer uh, KYC protocols for cryptocurrency exchanges and platforms and also we have to enhance monitoring uh, data and their analysis utilizing advanced tools to detect and address uh, suspicious activities and all Daryl, we had to just briefly cut off the, um, well, uh, Leo's presentation because it was uh, running a bit too long. But we have some questions for you for um, our panel. Um, first of all, just to go back to um, Jorge, there is a question for you, which is, if you can briefly answer it, how can you distinguish between Hawala and money laundering risk versus normal remittances going to countries in which not everyone has a bank account or identity card. Over to you briefly, Jorge. Okay, um, first of all, uh, I just would like to also acknowledge my partner, uh, Rashmi Singh, as part of the, the research with the confusion in the beginning, I forgot to acknowledge her. Um, regarding the remittances, that's difficult to speak briefly because this is actually Consider one of the very vulnerable sectors by the FATF. And uh, let me start by saying that remittance systems, they are legal. We have legal remittance systems. That's not the problem. The problem is that they should be regulated so that they can apply the same uh, AMLFT uh, rules and regulations as the financial sector does. So, for example, to implement the know your client and the monitoring of transaction and the communication of suspicious transactions. So the question is how each country will actually create regulations for the remittance system and enforce them to be very short. That's great. Um, and before I move, I move on to uh, Tun because I realized we cut him off and he might want to share maybe some conclusions. Um, can I just briefly ask uh, Giovanni and Matteo if they're happy to share their research with the rest of the attendees? And if so, please provide links in the uh, Q&A. And also, where can we find uh, case studies regarding um, the types of money flow that you mentioned in your research? Uh, yeah, thanks. So um, the case study, you know, are not still public in their um, declared for them, but they can be published in their anonymized form, of course. So, yeah, we're going to share the link, especially of the website and social media of Clap Grace, where you can then download all the material that also we have shown we give uh, today. So, I think that Matteo already uh, sent in the chat some links that direct you, you know, to the website where you can find all the materials that we are going to show. And in a few hours, we're going to upload also the slide of this presentation today. So we invite you to be updated with uh, Club to Trace uh, activities by the website and the social media. And this, could, and this way you can, you know, find all the materials that we have shown with you today. Additionally, if I may, we are writing an article, a paper, so eventually in some month, we will be able to present the results in a you know, coherent manner and with a, with a paper, actually. Yeah, well, it's extremely interesting and I'm sure my colleagues in the asset tracing team will want to read that paper. Uh, just one question for uh, Tun then. I mean, I was really surprised that the, uh, you know, the, the literature around financial well, around crime scripting took so long to actually look into the financial side of crime scripting. Why is that? Am I missing something or was there really like that big of a gap in the literature? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I think for now, until now, also uh, police, but also criminologists, I think, have been focusing on the goods and the people most of the time. So drugs, uh, murder like these actual criminal activities, we've all been focusing on that, uh, but also money laundering as a unique crime, criminal activity without paying too much attention to the, to the simple fact that all types of crime uh, relate to money. So money is a constant, as a, plays a constant role within all these um, uh, 
uh, uh, different types of criminal activities, especially the police, oftentimes is more interested in uh, catching the murderer or catching uh, the drugs instead of also taking away uh, money flows, legal money flows within all these types of crimes. So I hope with our research and our methodology, we'll to add this financial lens through, uh, through which to analyze these criminal activities. Of course, thank you. Um, I see another question in the Q&A uh, from Xavi. Can you pass again the link? Xavi, can you please specify which link you're referring to? And Mirko, maybe uh, over to you in two minutes. Uh, do you think the future of money laundering is online through crypto? What do you envisage seeing in the future for the discipline? Two minutes max. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, no, that's a good question. I, I mean, I really think that, of course, you know, cryptocurrencies in general provide new opportunities for laundering illicit proceeds. But at the same time, we all see, you also see that at the moment, you know, the offenders rely on basic money laundering schemes, on traditional schemes, you know, they rely on, for example, the real estate, the um, financial sector, of course, at large, a wall, and so on and so forth. Uh, cryptocurrencies at the moment, of course, provide new opportunities, but there are also some constraints that we need to take into account. For example, they have a limited um, spending possibilities. You know, there are no many places that accept, for example, direct purchases using cryptocurrencies at the moment. At the same time, you are exposed to some of the risks, uh, like, for example, you know, the risks of um, volatility in the price of Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies. So you may end up risk losing all your um, Bitcoins or your uh, earned, earned like illicit proceeds. So for sure, there will be new avenues, let's say, but at the moment, you know, you need also specific expertise for using these tools that probably most offenders do not have yet. So that's, that was just some insights to share. Thank you. That's amazing. Well, we have maybe one minute left. There's an open question. If money laundering becomes more complex, will this not mean that it will refocus efforts onto predicate crimes, that is the drugs, et cetera? Anyone has any thoughts? Literally the last 60 seconds. Uh, just um, to mention that money laundry is always evolving, the means, the ways that they do. And it's um, a game that constantly evolves. And the approach must be a holistic approach. So it should include both the pred predicate, but also the new methods, the new forms of money laundry. So it should be on both sides. Great. Um, I think we no longer have time for questions. We have to wrap it up. Um, I think we've had an incredible panel and I would invite all the attendees to maybe reach out to the panelists if they have additional questions. I mean, they've been incredibly uh, open and their presentations have been great. So, I mean, on behalf of everyone uh, here uh, and on behalf of the panelists, thank you very much for attending this session and um, I think that's it that's over from from us tonight